The broadcast is live. Welcome to the Here show we where we're going to take you from the Golden Girls all the way to dry crotches <laughs> to sushi. Put it all together yourself, folks. But anyway. <laughs> There's an indie comic TV show that premiered this week. Um, that probably no one knows this from a comic and no one will watch it. On the Sci-Fi Network, Resident Alien. Yeah. Ooh. I, I did not was, watch it. I'll I'll check it out sometime. But uh, I knew it was coming because number one, it's on sci-fi, so it's going to last not long. If it does, it's because the pandemic worked in its favor, you know. Yeah, yeah. It passed two but, seasons, and I expect it to reach my country in three years, and then they replay <laughs> it every day. So this is the show where it's an alien in human form. So we, he's right. the actor's got to act like an, an a, a right. doof alien, and he's going to be a detective. No, what it is is um, what's his name? Alan. It's not Tudyk. It's something like that. T u d y k e. Yeah, he's, he's from Firefly and lots of other things. A lot of things. And um, I read I read some of the comics, which are pretty good. Steve Parker House is the artist on the comic. I think he's a good artist. But anyway, an alien crash lands on Earth. He can't get off of Earth. He's stuck there. He put out a distress call, but who knows how long it's going to be till you know someone hears it and comes and gets him. And he looks like an alien, but he's got some sort of you know hypnotic power where he can convince other people he looks like an Earthling. But it doesn't always work. Some people can see through it. Some so it's there's so there's a lot of weirdness around him. He has the power and, to cloud the minds of men. Yeah, he can cloud the minds of men is basically what it is. But he can't, you know, some not all it's not a hundred percent. So he decides to settle into Earth society and he becomes a doctor because he's got advanced knowledge of medicine in like <laughs> a small town. So I guess he he becomes sort of, you know, it's the quirky detective genre where he's trying to hide. He's solving crimes with his doctor and alien skills kind of thing. And meanwhile, other people around him are going, is that guy an alien? Because it's, like, it's like, you know how people say there are lizard people in the world and every now and like the, you know, the whole British family is lizard people. And you can tell because every now and then their lizard people veneer goes away and you can see it in pictures. That sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it, like I, hopefully it'll get a second life somewhere else. I don't see it lasting on sci-fi, but um, but, it's, it, but it's funny because I've seen like no one mention it on YouTube. There's yeah. been no hot book alerts. There's been no you got to pick this up because the Resident Alien is a TV show. It's like no comic book people even know the comic book or TV show exists it's because dark time, place too, so that's not really that under the radar. Because it's well, not right. Well, I mean, it's because times have changed. It's got to be in a Marvel yeah. preview before it's considered. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I only found out about the comic last month. Oh I yeah, didn't know about the TV I, series. I actually always meant to buy that one, and I read some of it in Dark Horse Presents. But it, but, but since they released it in miniseries all the time. But I read some of it in, on Hoopla, I think it was, um, I'll, last I'll, year. And it's, it's, yeah. it's good. Whenever I'm going through my list on uh, to order my comics online, you know, you, it's by right. companies and stuff. And, uh, you know, I kind of remember seeing it, but it didn't stick out. It never really made me slow down. But um, I'm also still kind of burned over a TBS show that was called uh, People of Earth that I really got into. <laughs> so I don't know. They canceled it and it was good. There's no ending, I think. And uh, I don't think I can invest myself again like that just to get that, burned. You know, was that the one that took place right up there in the Hudson River? Um, aliens were on Earth and they took place like it was a small Hudson town. It was like a little the, the three Yorkers. races of aliens got together to take us over. You had the lizard people. You had the little gray right. aliens. Yes, then, yes. Yeah. Then you, had, then you had then you had the beautiful elf like alien, right? Right. Who uh, had a taste for the uh, romantic, uh, you know, earthling women. Women. That was his, you know, his weakness and stuff. Right. And uh, the great little gray alien was hilarious. And I think Conan O'Brien produced it. It was fantastic. Uh -huh. It was. Yeah, that great. was good. Yeah, and it, and it took place in a little town that's like 15 miles away from me across the river. So I was like, "Oh, look at that!" Be careful. Yeah. yeah. 
You're going to get afflicted. They're going to do experiments on you. You know, I don't know if we've had this discussion before or not, but something that always bothered me about the whole visit by aliens thing is if we have these cultures that have the technology to travel here from another planet, galaxy, dimension, whatever they be, why do they keep crashing when they get here? They're really not that good at it, you know. I mean, are they like sending very early days of their space travel? You know, they don't understand not... gravity. <laughs> well, here's how I look at it. You ever been like traveling and then you start getting a flat and you take that exit to where you don't know where you're at? They were <laughs> that's what was happening. They were having problems and the earth just happened to be that exit. But <laughs> I mean it's it's great to talk about this stuff, but I'm one of those people that have zero belief in aliens that we've been visited uh, or anything. Too, right? I, I, it's it would explain Polly, sure. <laughs> <laughs> the the math just doesn't work in the fit. Well, actually, the math works in the favor of aliens existing. The math does not work in the favor of them being able to find us. I don't want them here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I am a believer. I was so glad about two or three years ago. I don't know who they quoted. It might have been Carl Sagan or something, but I've always been in the mind of like, you know, the aliens invading the invasions while they're here. Mm -hmm. That's that's the truth. And then finally people started saying it. It'd be like Columbus finding the, the Indians. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm sitting here like some alien disease could wipe us all out. They wouldn't see us as a civilization. They see us as an anthill. You know what I'm saying? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, who knows? Especially if they just watch how we act here in the last, you know, four right. years. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I always say this to people who are like, um, like they can't understand like when the Europeans, how the Europeans didn't even really, a lot of them didn't even see the Native Americans as people. They were kind of less than them. And I was like, we look down on people who can't work a phone these days. Yeah. Imagine if someone was in the Stone Age. Well, see, that's what, just what, human nature. So imagine what it's like when someone can't work a phone. You're like, oh my goodness, well, who's this idiot? Well, yeah. see, see, and and it blows my mind because I end up having another. If if I invest myself, I end up having a whole other conversation of like, how can you act like people from three, four hundred, five hundred years ago act like they think like we do? We got mm -hmm. this way from what history has done. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You know, the mm -hmm. enlightenment comes with time and. Right. And I can't stand when people try to hold the standards of now and hold it against the standards of somewhere in the past. I mean, you can't even hold the same standards for the 60s that you can now. You know what I mean? And there's people walking around who are around in the 60s. We can't even figure out a standard for everybody right here and now. Right. right. <laughs> well, it's funny. I don't. I might have the paper in my jacket pocket, but I've recently. I'm, we'll get to comics in a minute, but I've. Re yeah. I can't believe I never found this. But there's 21 ways of the samurai to live alone in life if you're a man, uh, and it's like oh. this 400 400 year old book written by like this great samurai who had 61 wins in zero. Well, uh, zero, you know, zero losses. It actually popped up in a video in my feed recommended to me. Uh. And I'm watching this one and I'm watching this guy talk about the 21 rules. And I'm like, my life experience has me following 17. I didn't even know this was a thing. <laughs> I already found 17 of the rules on my own. I wish I'd wrote them down. You know, you just, you just mentioned samurai. And the first thing that popped into my head was, are there any good samurai comics? I mean, besides ones from Japan, probably lone wolf and I mean, cup. Well, yeah, exactly. But are there any good American samurai comics? Frank Miller's Ronin. Yeah. What was that? Oh. Usagi Jimbo? Yeah, there's a good samurai Usagi comic. Usagi Jimbo? Yeah. But they don't really one... try to make much stuff in the, United, in the United States with samurai. We, we like to see uh, samurai and ninjas, but they usually pop up in modern settings. Uh, and see, and they, they have to involve the, the Yakuza cool. somehow. Plus, all the all people's concepts of ninjas are like from '80s action movies. Real ninjas were not like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think Neil was it Neil Adams. I think Continu Continuity Comics had a uh, female samurai, or maybe that was her name. That's right, something like yeah. the two D's at the end. That was that was one of the first books. I mean, I was able to move on back then. If I didn't like something, I just kind of moved on. I didn't really rage. Um, 
But that one made me angry. I read that and I'm like, this is so yuck. You know, I'm like, you know? <laughs> that that book starred her behind. That's what yeah. that book. Which that book, book was an excuse to draw nice asses. <laughs> she had the Bridget. You remember uh, Bridget Nelson in Rocky Three? Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, put put a black headband on her. Put a. I wouldn't even say they were shorts. You know what I mean? And they a were black like shoulder pad triangle black. Didn't she top. have like the, like the bathing suit cut top yeah. with like something hang? Sort of like Electra with something hanging down the back, or or did she not even have something hanging down the back? The way I remember, it, she didn't. She may have had a sash across the waist. That yeah. might be what you're thinking of. I which, don't know. Uh, which book are you I, talking about again? Sam Marie from Com uh, Continuity Comics. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it up if I can find it. I'm gonna bring it up, man. Hey, we don't that have might, a lot of samurai comics, but we sure do have a hell of a lot of Japanese female assassin comics. Uh. Oh gosh, I just realized you guys can see me and I can't see you. This is <laughs> well, uh, ooh, I think you can start bringing up the comments because we have half a dozen people already. No. Well, All I, right. Here's one I just I just forgot about that I have on my shelf. Is this uh, Ron Mars and Ross? Is this Luke Ross? Uh, yeah, Ron Mars and Luke Ross, Samurai Heaven on Earth, Heaven and Earth, Volume Two. This is one that's been on my shelf. When when did this one come out? Two thousand and seven. Yeah, there it is. It won't let me go full screen on the pictures. I don't know what the deal is, but there she is. Oh, look at this. Way back when. That was a controversial Spider-Woman cover a few years ago. <laughs> and it turns out it's from Continuity Comics in the 80s. Uh -huh. We can blame Neil Adams. Well, what do you know? You mean people blame something on somebody besides Frank Cho? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know I... Why, considering how popular Neil Adams always was, how come num, never, num, uh, none of the continuity comics uh, ever made it past issue four or something? I don't. Uh, uh, they were all uh, very good. Yeah, yeah. they were. They, right. With the help of Neil Adams, he could write. It's because Neil Adams was. This was the Neil Adams studio. It wasn't about the work. It's that it was Neil Adams. So yeah. the writing was horrible. I love armor. That's my book. I've got a bunch of those, but it's more of the design. If you try to read the book, yeah. you're, just, you're just sort of like, what the hell did they skip? Reading those books, you feel like you, they skip two, three pages, the way they mm -hmm. transition. If you call what, it a transition. One of my favorite bits of cover copy was on, I think it was an armor cover, um, where he was standing there saying, in order for you to live, armor must die, and yeah. armor will not die. I just, yeah. I just love that cover. I love that word balloon. But armor <laughs> was cool because they just kept piling on the cool stuff for armor. First, he was yeah. just an angry young boy with his brother, kind of a hawk and dove situation. They get the alien grabs him. He gets an eye put out, and then he gets a ruby put in there. And then he learns this space martial arts that you don't have on Earth. And then they give him this armor with a where every piece will make a weapon plus a costume, a snazzy costume. And you know, they just kept like, you know, they just kept adding, he's got a cool knife. You know, they just kept <laughs> adding stuff to him, you know. <laughs> and that, that was it. They never really did character development with anything. His brother gets his arm, his hands cut off, and they replace him so he's the silver streak with these things that will these hand they look just like hands, but he's got a nice big silver cuff now and they shoot beams, you know. You know, well, you they're writing them a this, lot more than I do. Yeah. And while they're mm -hmm. writing this, it, it's one of those things where I would insert Ralphie from the Christmas story <laughs> writing his essay, going, Boy, that's great. That's what <laughs> it feels like. You know? yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's good stuff. They just keep doing it, you know. Does somebody say go through the comments? Yeah, we already have like half a dozen people around here. Mine, yeah. I'm chilling, mind man. So you guys feel free. Yeah. Yeah, mind the comics just mentioned that one I just showed Heaven, Samurai, yeah. Heaven and Earth with uh, Rob awesome. Ripa. At uh, first, I, I thought it might be something from Cross Gen because they had a Samurai comic as well, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, they had. Um, <laughs> what am I, thinking of? I wonder if this is the <laughs> same Vincenzo who's been around for a while. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They Matthew. had um, Way of the Rat, 
which was a kung fu comic. Yeah, but I that don't think it's a samurai comic. No, that was the the one with martial arts. But there was I know there was a samurai one, but I can't remember the title. A friend of mine bought it. Neither do I, I bought most of them. I can't remember that one right now. I completely forgot about this, but it's about not Billy Jack. Michael here brought up Billy yeah. Jack films had a samurai. First of mm. all, you can get all this Billy Jack films on DVD for like 10 bucks at Walmart. But I have yeah. a movie called with Charles Bronson from the 60s, Ursula Andrews, called uh, Red Sun, where a samurai comes oh. to the Wild West. I remember and, that one. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, he's, he's tied like 10 knots. And every day he unties a knot. And if he doesn't capture his prisoner in 10 days, he's got to, um, what is it called? Not Harry Carey. Is it Harry Seppuku. Carey? Seppuku. Seppuku. Thank you. I got Will Ferrell in my head doing Harry Carey now. I just, Ooh, I'm getting well, right. I think that's one version of it, but you know, one of What's the best the samurai. Uh, um, that's what I'm looking for. One of the best samurai projects of all is Samurai Jack. Oh, was yeah. that a comic? Yeah, no, the animated show. Yeah. yeah, we're talking samurai comics. We can talk samurai TV show and uh, movies some other day. Yeah, well, yeah oh, I, comics I mean, here. I mentioned Ronan, but like I don't want to ruin it. When you find the end out, I don't want to ruin it. You know what I mean? But Ronan, mm. Ronan had a twist ending. Uh, was was the path the samurai comic from Cross Gen? Yeah, that, yeah. Is that it? Who did that, that one? That was, was that like Bart yeah. Sears or somebody who started it? I can't remember. Might have been. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I think it may have an issue or two with that, but I was yeah. never a Bart Sears fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then and then I'm just going to, it's not even an honorable mention, but uh, I'm going to throw out Watchmen there because Samurai movies were so popular. All the gangs, the knotheads, did the do. They all got, mm -hmm. that's where they got their their hair, hair, you know, their, they all made themselves in Watchmen? Samurais in Watchmen. In Wa yeah. I, I don't remember the, I haven't read Watchmen in so long. I don't remember the gangs in Watchmen. Yeah, oh, they're the ones who kept. Yeah, the not tops. Okay, yeah, yeah. They're the ones that uh, killed the original Night Owl. They're the ones that tried to jump oh Silk Spectre when she was just okay. wearing a trench coat and heels with Night Owl in the alley, and we got to see the fat pudgy guy, you know, kick a little butt. Did the, did the punk, the the, the, the gangs in uh, Dark Knight Returns have some kind of top? What were they? they were they? No, they like, they're almost like Zippy the Pinhead shaved head kind of things. Yeah, spiked okay. uh, spiked mohawks, that kind of thing. The mutants. Okay. They all they they wore Cyclops's headgear. You <laughs> know, they were like a Mad Max kind of a game. Yeah. What were they called again? Did they have a name? The, the mutants. The mutants. That's why they had Cyclops's headgear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but were they hung out in the? Uh, were they hung out in the? Uh, junkyard the big garbage place for all gotham and they had the great big huge gang leader uh and yeah. stuff like that i get the mad max feel from it you oh, know what i'm saying yeah. been funny if his name was leroy brown mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm trying to think if there was any samurai stuff i read like in uh heavy metal or something you know well it's there's a lot of female japanese assassin books Kabuki and she and all that stuff, but I don't think any Which of them are Kabuki actually samurai. Kabuki is actually good. No. Do you guys remember Whisper from the 80s? No. Wait. I think she may have been a ninja influenced one. What was she what was she in? Was she in Daredevil? No, no. Wait no, no, no. She was her own series. Hold on, let me see. I think I've got the it first, over here. In first comics. I remember Stephen Grant. Uh, complaining in it when he had a co uh, column at CBR, complaining that nobody bought it. Yeah, because I, I bought it, and yeah. maybe five or six years ago, Usagi. Yeah, that's the best yeah. of the Samurai Scott, comics. Yeah, Scott brought that up, man. The yeah, it's the uh, yeah, Scott turned but me on to Usagi. But I try. I remember I bought I bought Whisper off the stands back in the eighties, and it was I remember it being kind of mediocre, but good enough for me to buy. I enjoyed it. I tried rereading it, I don't know, five, ten years ago, and I couldn't make it through more than three issues. I was like, all right, I, I've had enough of this. <laughs> Do you remember Zen, the Intergalactic Ninja? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, Rob River mentioned uh, Way of the Rat, too. That was, uh, or was that was Cross, he said Valiant Comics. Oh, Rye. 
There we go. My, I can't see without my glasses. Was Rai a ninja or a samurai? Don't know. Don't, he had the no. rise. No, there was bloodshot about the rising. So I have all those issues in his first appearance and everything. I should know, but they okay. definitely gave him a samurai vibe. You know, uh, with the I don't remember reading the, Rai ever. Rai was cool. Rai was very cool. But I, I, I was serious. I bet it's been since nineteen ninety eight since I've read the yeah. book. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give it to it because every time I've talked about Valiant Comics and brought him up, I tell people that I think his name is either Ray or Rai. I go with Rai because of Samurai. You see what right. I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was a very, uh, I thought it was a cool book. I love that character, but uh, okay. I, he was he was meant to die, you know. Mm -hmm. At least it's not straight street poet Rye. And then when they brought back like <laughs> then when they like brought back the next dude, he actually had the samurai man bun. Yeah. You know? Top knot. Yeah. Top knot. Yeah. The only people who should be wearing those. <laughs> yeah, unless your name is Toshiro Mafune, you probably shouldn't be wearing a top knot. <laughs> I've, I've worn a top knot top knot many a time when you have super straight hair. That's what you'd have to do to keep it out of your eyes sometimes. Well, it's different if you're out working. You know what I mean? It's different when it's uh, a work uh, thing. It's when you're being I can remember There was one time back when I used to get into local pickup basketball games around here. Uh, I was in my 20s probably up at a uh, little local. I used to, it was when, um, it was right after the era when I spiked up all my hair. So I was growing it all out to one length. And to play basketball, I used to have to put a top knot in. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. those guys, didn't, they had no idea how to take me. They were just like, because yeah. they were all complete strangers in pickup basketball games. So I got you. I still find that funny. Yeah, well, I'm going to clarify. I'm gonna clarify. I, yeah, I'm going to clarify. If you're doing an activity that causes you to sweat, <laughs> you do what you got to do. Keep your hair out of your eyes. It's when you're it's when you're wearing the scarf and you're being fashionable with it, you know, acting like it's a fashion statement, a, a style, yeah. if you will. No, no, you know, fashion. Do, do you you got a scarf the ascot. <laughs> Anybody get any comics this week? No, nope. I got something off of eBay, but uh, you know, I didn't I think, even think about comics this week. <laughs> Not even think. Ah, oh, poor guy. <laughs> Didn't have the time. But uh, well, I'll go ahead and show what I got here. First of all, it, it's more like upgrades. And it, when I ran across it, I had to get it get it because I think it was like three bucks. Seriously, you know, mm -hmm. I could be wrong. It's but it's we're in the ballpark, right? But here's my originals: the Warriors of the Shadow Realm, Plue, oh, John yeah. Buscema, ah. uh Weird World, that kind of stuff. Great uh, mm -hmm. pages that fold out that just this was some of this to me is like some of John Bushima's best work. I remember yeah. those. I think I yeah. still, yeah, I have those in a box. 78, 79. And I loved, uh, I remember this. Uh, they were talking about, they were telling you Epic Illustrated was coming. <laughs> and for some uh, reason, yeah. and for some reason, you know, as a kid, I thought this was something to do with Monty Python. Can you see it? <laughs> Does it yeah. not make you think Python? You know, yep. So what I did is I got upgrades. The ones that I have are one or one or two might be fine, but they're held together by scotch tape. And, and there's nothing wrong right. with owning a book like that. That is love. This this book was read till it disintegrated, and the guy kept it together. Whoever had him mm -hmm. first. So I'm totally with him. So I got some uh, copies that I've already opened them to inspect them. So uh, yeah, this is these are going to be my very fine set. You know what I'm saying? So. That yeah. reminds me of, um, uh, I don't know, it must be 15 years ago now, uh, in the early 2000s. Two of my favorite series from when I was a kid was Omega the Unknown and the series that kind of started me collecting, which was Hulk, like 200 to maybe 205. And I, I still had my original issues, but I, I rebought them all in mint condition. Because that's how I remember them in my mind. When I look at the issues I've had, I had for you know 20, 30 years, they were all beaten up and torn up, and because you know I'd read them so much, I'm like, that doesn't look what the now. And I'm looking at them now, going, that's that's not what this looks like in my memory. So I wanted to get new, <laughs> fresh looking copies because that's how they looked in my memory. 
Oh, I have a few books I have to do that with, but I'll end up buying more than one. It's funny you said Omega the Unknown because I whipped out the trade and I was reading it the other night, picking up where I left off, mm -hmm. you know. But I moved everything to make sure that I had a clear desk so we could do the show. But I can't believe you just brought up Omega the Unknown. I mean, I was just reading it. <laughs> that first issue blew my mind when I was 10. The mother talking, her just her head, her robot head talking to her son. I was like, whoa. <laughs> See, Omega, yeah, Omega the Unknown is something I'm real careful with. I don't want to overhype it and make it act like mm -hmm. somebody's going to pick it up and it's going to blow them away. But um, it's like, it was 20 years before its time. To me, it's the original yeah. Vertigo book. When, right. they, when, when the two girls are walking through New York, and I think... Um, I mean, uh, Steve Gerber's girlfriend or wife was based on one of those girls. She had a hand mm -hmm. in creating one of the girls in it. But when they're walking through New York and stuff, man, it feels visceral. It feels real. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? That's that that's what amazes like, me. That doesn't feel like Marvel Comics, New York. Right. Hmm. That feels like, you know, 70s New York City, New York. Well, Steve real. Gerber's... Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Scott. I was say real New York. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Gerber's work that I mean, there's two books I can think of off the top of my head where I always felt like Steve Gerber hated New York, but you have mm -hmm. the New York and Omega, the unknown that feels mm -hmm. dirty and nasty and cruel. And then you have uh, this guardians of the galaxy story he did in Marvel premiere or whatever Marvel presents where right. the guardians of the galaxy are still in the future. And they land on an alien planet. It looks just like Steve Gerber's New York that he put like in that kiss special. You know what I mean? <laughs> And it turns out by the end of it, they're rescued by these aliens who are like the guards, the overseers of the planet. Right. And the whole planet is where all these aliens, all these other planets send their mentally ill. And they, they look at them. They're like, well, why did you make the planet look like New York Earth? And they were like, we well, didn't do that. They did it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, see, Let's see the first comic I got it. this week. Yeah. If, if you had bought... Omega the Unknown back in the day from the store, brought it home in a brown paper bag and pulled it out. You would have literally had Omega the Unknown comic. Oh, that's that's still there? so bad. It makes yeah. you just Hit the wrong button. Okay. Yeah, hold on. There we go. <laughs> what issue is this? 31 Monstrous is on. It's been and going on for a while. The old gods looking down on you. About to wreck your city. Yeah, this one doesn't. There's a lot of brown in this one. It doesn't show up too well on the screen. It shows but, up. But you know, this has been a good series. Uh, they have it all in trade paperbacks now. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if anyone picks up issue 31, they're gonna have any clue what's going on. <laughs> Is everyone here still with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're still here. You can you can take me off the big screen for a moment then. All right. I actually stepped what? away for a minute. I thought I was okay. being okay. That's yeah. all it was. Yeah, but monstrous after two that Mo monstrous had issue thirty, and they usually go on hiatus, but instead they put out two extra issues of a little mini series giving you the history of some of the characters. And those two issues were really good. They were just sort of little slice of life moments of the characters in the story and I really enjoy now we're back to like the big the big story the big shooting war where I can't even keep track of all the politics that are going on <laughs> so since I haven't read you know the last issue before this was you know three months ago I was like who's on whose side Cloak and Dagger New York City was badass yeah I have about six issues of Cloak and Dagger uh, Rick, Bill Mantlo, Rick Leonardo. It's a mix of the first two miniseries or whatever it was, or oh. ongoing or whatever they were. Never read them yet. I read, you know, so I'm just saying, you know. Yeah. I, Cloak and Dagger was one of those series I always wanted to be better than it was. Yeah. Cause they looked real cool. They had cool names. There was usually good art, but the stories were just kind of eh. They fought to keep them street level and kept the theme of drugs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, because drugs is what, you know, mut mutating drugs, street drugs gave them their powers, you know? I, it was just weird. There was just no, it was, it, it was like, you know, Cloak and Dagger being, I don't even remember the stories. I just remember them not being interesting. 
See, you just described about 90% of Marvel during the 80s for me. Yeah, but the, oh, the mini yeah. series was interesting enough uh, as an origin story. Uh, right. The problem is when you try to make them the main characters in their own book, and, and that was a problem with Volume 2, they really didn't have much to, much to go with because uh, they were teenagers living alone on, on the street and they would need a very interesting supporting cast to make the book work, and that just wasn't there. Yeah, From what I remember, the, the villains... The Mr. Jig or something. I mean, they handed it off to Terry Austin to write. You know what I mean? <laughs> but the whole concept was like, it was like this rich girl and this street-level guy, and now they have to be together because she feeds his darkness so he doesn't go insane or something, mm. you know? What's interesting, on the TV show, they switched that. They made uh, they made him a rich guy and her a poor girl. I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, well, I'm not. It, it's it's the era that they did it in now. It, it's not mm -hmm. for. It, never mind. I'm not going to go there. You know. Yeah, yeah, but, I know. Yeah, I never watched the show, and I forgot. The show I, was okay. I the forgot show was all not about free, it. It was not terrible. It was okay. Well, I tried to watch the Inhumans about two months ago, and I made it fifteen minutes in, and I'm like, "What <laughs> is this shit?" You know, I'm like, you know, I'm like, <laughs> that was a little less than okay. All the budget but, was on Medusa's hair, anyway. Much more than okay is Usagi Yojimbo Wanderer's Road issue number three, with the Peach Momoko cover because this is the reprint book, and I had forgotten about this character. This all takes place with. Um, the blind samurai character is except he can smell things. Um, yeah. What was the name of the blind samurai in the movies? Um, Zato Ichi. That sounds about right. I think he's got a name that's sort of like that too. I think well, Zato it's, Ichi. It's also made blind. me think of another samurai character, Long Goat and Kid. <laughs> I forgot all about them. They're in Usagi. Yeah. Zato Ino is this character's name. So Zato Ichi was, um, I think he was the blind samurai in famous Japanese movies. Yeah. I think everybody has this same idea about Pumpkin Dagger. There's a, there's a zeitgeist here, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they just, time. they, they, they were some of those characters, like they looked cool. They had good artwork. They seemed they had great names. They seemed like a good idea. There were just no good comics about them. Rick Leonard, I signed my, some of yeah. my copies of it at Heroes Con, and he was actually doing a commission at the time of a dagger for somebody. He really didn't. He, he either was busy, focused on his drawings, or he really had no stories to tell about that era with cloak and dagger. Like it was just yeah. a job, you know. So yeah, yeah. Then I picked up the latest issue of Spawn. I've been Still enjoying going. this uh, Spawn series. It's got it's got nice bright Spawn art as as opposed to the dark murky art it had for years. And it's the last of the two ninety nine books. I started picking it up a couple issues ago just because I liked the art, and it's a pretty fun story. All these. All these spawns are somehow from all different dimensions are trapped on Earth and they're trying to take it over. And our spawn is trying to stop. I, I uh, you know, I can, I've read so few issues of Spawn. I don't really know much about so his was, background and stuff. It's amazing this trope that's popped up, right? All these other dimension spawns pop up. Flash is going to go through the dimensions with all these Batman. Spider-Man had the um, animated tune that had all the Spider-Man from the yeah. multiverse. And now they're going to be doing it in the next Spider-Man movie, it sounds like. It's just amazing how... It's something easier that to match up characters with different genres than to create new characters. It just, yeah, it just, yeah. And this is the very thing that people used to be mad at DC about, except for me. It wasn't hard yeah. to follow, I didn't think. you know, But yeah... It, it doesn't appeal to me very. That's one of the reasons I don't like Marvel and DC characters because, as I've said before, there's nine different versions of everybody. Everybody's got a family, and to me, that's just like ah. But there's one Samari. There's only one Samari, and she's got a great ass. So <laughs> let's draw it in all the issues. It's drawn, but <laughs> in comics. For some that's reason, I remember on the title. 
for some reason, I remember Mark Beecham drawing some of those too. He was one of those continuity guys who specialized in in females derrieres. So. <laughs> When they were relaunching the JSA back in 99, they came out with these one-shots, All Winter Squad, All Star. They, they named each issue. And what it did is it was two stories. I think one was like in the 40s, and then the second feature would be like present or something like that. But they had one with Hawk Woman, Hawk Girl and Wonder Woman teaming up. And every shot that they could, they'd have like an upskirt on Wonder Woman. They were like, uh, they were like <laughs> doing it like pinup girls throughout the story. You know, just from the camp, from yeah. the angle that the artist was drawing, and I was just like reading this, like, what the hell, you know? Like, <laughs> 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 then we've got Steve Scrochi's Post Americana issue number two, um, post apocalyptic story. Uh, I well got all Mad Max on us uh, this issue with this ca- tribe of cannibals, but well, but. I'm I'm enjoying this one because I like his artwork and there's lots of gore and stuff. If you like sort of horror gore and and stuff like that, this is good for you. But um, Sun's Cloak is second to none. What was funny about this was I completely mixed up the characters in my head as I was reading it. Because the two main characters are, there's this, um, you know, that... um, that like fort that's in some mountain in Denver, that like Doomsday Mountain yeah. where yeah. everyone yeah. high end complex. Challenger's right. Mountain. I know what it is. Yeah. Challenger's Well, mountain. that's what survived <laughs> through this doomsday. So there's this whole society living in this mountain, and they want to go out and conquer the rest of the Mad Max United States or Ununited States. But some of the guys in the mountain were like, Oh, you're evil. We don't want you conquering the whole United States. So some of them like broke out and tried to, to warn the people out there, who, of course, are all these Mad Max people who are, you know, crazy. And But anyway, there was a guy who broke out, and then this woman who's on the... She, she's like, I don't know, the Conan or Mad Max character uh, who lives out there, and oh, uh, there she is. Like, she she would be the Mad Max character. So, in and I haven't read it since the first issue, so I'm reading the second issue, uh, and they're both captured by these cannibals. And, and for some reason, I flipped them in my head. I thought he was from the he was the Mad Max character and she was from the city. And I swear it wasn't until halfway through where I realized I had them mixed up in my head. And I went, oh, that makes a lot more sense now that I remember that. <laughs> Sometimes you just mix things up when you read comics <laughs> month to month. <laughs> I think we've unlocked a, like a, a, a little uh, corner of memory that I've never really tapped into. But all of a sudden, like all this talk about cloak and dagger, they even had a villainess who got her powers. I could be wrong. Got her powers because she found a piece of cloak's cloak that was ripped. It was like a little strip, almost like a uh-huh. Doctor Who scarf size piece. And it kind of like floated around her. And that's where she got her power. You know, <laughs> you know <so> <laughs> And then I remember there was like this green chick who had punk green hair too, looked like Nightmare's daughter or something. I don't know if it was really supposed to be in her, but yeah. Go, sorry, man. Go on. Go on. And that, now I just thought of this too as you talked about that. I think the whole drug angle was, you know, the whole cloak and dagger being so anti-drug. Their hook, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Reagan's Didn't... comic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't think it works because. <laughs> If you're actually anti-drug, you don't want to read a comic about drugs. You know about being, like like who would that who would that appeal to? If you're pro-drug and you're like woohoo, let's do some blow, man. You don't want to read Cloak and Dagger. And if you're, uh, I don't want to. I, I don't want to read drugs. You're not going to read Cloak and Dagger either. The, the whole idea falls completely on its head when you think about it. Uh, drugs are bad. This is what happens to you if you're on drugs. So if I'm on drugs, I develop superpowers? There's that. None of it made any sense. <laughs> if they they should have just left the whole drug angle out of it. Well, less than 10 years later, Mark Grunewald had to write a story where it wasn't a super soldier serum drug that gave Captain America his powers. It was a virus. So yeah. germ warfare is better than drugs in Marvel's opinion. 
you know. See, I don't, I don't think, I don't think he had to write that story. <laughs> I just think he did. Scott, all we're going to do is get the thumbnail of you of that look right there. That's <laughs> that's going to be the thumbnail if I can figure out how to do it right there. <laughs> oh, oh, and then the next comic I got was the latest issue of Dynamite. Got another zombie cover. I th who is this? This is Zombie Danger Thoris, and this is Marvel Zombies with what? the dynamite. Hold on, hold on, keep it up. And um, I'm going to spoil the ending for you just because I want any fans to know he's in this book. Is the, the last page, Evil Ernie shows up. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I don't know how many Evil Ernie fans there are out there, but if you're one, oh, you show up in this book. I I'm glad Pelut uh, I mean, I'm sorry that Brian didn't get to keep his character, but at least he has Lady Death and he's making a fortune. So right. takes it's got to take the sting away. Right. But th this has been a fun you know, it's been a fun series. There's an oh, what's that? There's an awesome early oh, Frank gonna... Angel Dust. Yes, I remember that oh. one. I was going to let you finish, man. I was just getting it ready. Yeah. But, okay. um, yeah, Dynamite has been good. I picked it up on a whim and have been enjoying it. Yeah, I remember that issue. But, you know, superpowers look sexy like Dagger. Yeah. <laughs> but that was – if every issue of Miller's Daredevil was like that Angel Dust issue, you'd get real tired of it real fast. <laughs> you know, I, I, can, I can remember reading that issue off the stands and going, oh – that was cool, but but you know there was no angel dust in my world. I was living in the suburbs. I was what year was Frank Miller? Nineteen eighty? Did that come out? Probably because that was an early issue. Yes, seventy nine to like eighty two, maybe something like yeah, that. Yeah, my head. So yeah. I was like fourteen, fifteen years old, living in the suburbs, reading about the scourge of angel dust. It was like, yeah, mm. a little tough relating to that. <laughs> oh, look what's on my shelf. Right here, easy. Oh Look wow! Yeah. <laughs> two number ones, two of them. <laughs> Angel dusted. Wasn't that the name of the Angel dusted? Was that the name of that story? You see, by the by the time I was your age, I think no, I probably was still like twelve or thirteen. The thing was computers by then. We moved away from the drugs. We were on the computers. I had bit and bite in Firestorm number 24 or whatever it was. That also was the first appearance. Uh, it was the second part of the story, but it was also the first appearance of the Blue Devil. And I thought I had gold in my hands at 12, you know. The Blue Devil. I had a first appearance. <laughs> well, maybe we can start a rumor. There's, there's going to be a, a Blue Devil TV show. <laughs> based on the movie from the dc comic world yeah <laughs> you know what's weird you just put this thought in my head i don't think i ever thought i had gold in my hands with a number one issue because when you think about when i was when i was 12 that would put it at um 1978 and in 1978 what First issues of the last, I don't know, three or four years were worth any money? None of them. Mm. It was just after the DC implosion. We had all those first issues that were worthless. Um, Marvel first issues were what? The Human Fly? Uh, maybe so, Micronaut? Hey, man, I had Batman the Outsiders, number one, the first appearance yeah. of Blue Devil. I, you know yeah. what I mean? The Flash yeah. killed Professor Zoom. I mean, it was happening for me, man. You know, I'm like, you know? Was, like all of this, all of the stuff that was rising up in price around my time was like, you know, first appearance of Punisher, Silver first Age, appearance, uh, Wolverine, uh, first uh, giant size X Men, number one. None of those, you know, most of them weren't first issues. Even Giant Size X Men number one wasn't a real first issue. It was an annual. First issues of annuals aren't worth anything. I'm want I'm wanting to pull out if I have it over here a Comics Buyer's Guide for like from 1979 or something. And Fantastic Four number one was worth like 90 bucks in it. You know, I actually have that. I did a video on it once. The first one I got was like 79 or 80. Yeah. I'll have to pull it out. I think it's back in my closet. You know, Overstreet? Yeah, yeah. Overstreet. yeah. 
That was the the very first, and and I loved it just for the comic history of it. I yes. mean, there was just so so many articles in it and stuff you could look up and stuff you didn't know. I agree with you. Like everybody else is looking for prices, but just like you, know, yeah. I more as a reference. Oh, yeah, it's a Bill I, Ward cover, huh? Yeah, and I don't think this is the one I'm thinking of. Let me take what, a look. What here. year is that? That's what I'm looking at. Because the one I've got is an Alex Schomburg cover. I got this for six bucks, probably like about 12 years ago. So 1978, uh, 1979. See. see, folks, this is how you do it. You pick up this kind of stuff. <laughs> 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 Scott, <laughs> you had an accent there for like five seconds. I mean, where did that come from? I've been around my wife a lot lately, and I'm picking up her accent a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah, it'll it'll go away. I'll I'll yeah. Okay. I'm seeing if this is the one where like Fantastic Four number one was worth was was worth ninety bucks. Yeah, it's real fun going back looking through like old magazines like famous monsters of film land and see just either how cheap certain things hey, were not. or conversely when home video first came out seeing just how ungodly expensive uh, first run movies were on video when they oh yeah i mean yeah and and i like 20 bucks for one movie it's like eek, you know? and i like finding stuff you never heard about both with what you're talking about and with this there's right. a book called the fighting man in 1952 the fighting man yeah I like to I see the body again. Man I'm the brain boy. Uh oh. Is Jared gone? Yeah. Again. See, you were talking about cloaks earlier, and now he has a cloaking device. <laughs> Fantastic Comics. Fantastic Four, number one $200. Four hundred dollars, six hundred dollars. So apparently, I'm misremembering something, but I saw something where it was ninety bucks within my. I life. froze again. Maybe, I maybe saw that. not here. Yeah. Maybe Amazing Fantasy number fifteen. This not was the very first one I ever got. It's yeah. falling apart. Um. Oh, look at that. Pages are coming right in. I did a video looking through this once. There's an ad drawn by Jimmy Pagliotti in here. Oh, wow. Nice. He drew for, for a local New York City comic book shop that he drew when he was in high school. Yeah. But yeah, look. Look at that. I, I got three or four books here. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, this is the first one I ever got. I read through it all the time. I loved all these covers back here. Because this is the first time I ever got to see these Golden Age covers and stuff. You know, right. in 1970, what is this? 10th anniversary issue. I think this is 79, 80. You couldn't find that stuff anywhere. The uh, Palo, the amazing, fantasy, the amazing Fantasy you're talking about, they only list number 15 in this book. All right. And uh, it says Amazing Fantasy 7 to 14, semicolon, Amazing Adventures 1 through 6. And then they just list number 15 with the actual price, $120 to $360 in 1978, yeah. 79. Real cheap back then. <laughs> Original art was super cheap back then, too, compared to what it is now. Well, I want that one issue where, you know, Spider Man had pupils, you know. That's why it's really worth money. No, you know, like, no. <laughs> I want Amazing Fantasy number fifteen because I want to read the the backup stories. <laughs> I think Aunt May actually appeared a few issues uh, before that. Uh, well, she and Uncle Ben, like before there was even a Peter Parker imagined. You know, well, that, that's it just because they typical typical the same type of characters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They call them prototypes these days, but they weren't really. They were just, you know, Steve Ditko only had, yeah, I went into the dungeons back there. Steve Ditko only had so many old women characters that he drew. So, you know, he pulled one out of his, uh, pulled one out of his stock of old women characters when he had to draw that issue. And then he pulled her out again when he had to draw Aunt May. 
Let's see. The very last comic I got this week was a number one. Dead End Kids. What is this? The Suburban Jobs. I guess this is their second series. Wait a minute. I, this cover is awful. I just did not like this cover at all, but I flipped it open and liked the inside art. I thought the inside art was pretty cool. That was actually a comic short this week. So um, I decided to pick this one up. And I think it's only a, a three-issue series. So I put it on my poll because I liked the first issue. Just these kids who find a bag of money. And it's going to lead them to trouble. You know that. Because it's drug dealer money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Cloak and Dagger could, you know, take care of that right away. Mm -hmm. But all the kids would be boring. And so would the drug dealers. <laughs> But yeah, pretty good. But I, I don't usually you like the cover and you pick it up and the art is awful inside. I thought the art was awful on the cover and liked the inside. What was it called again? Dead yeah. End Kids, the Suburban Job. Oh, oh, okay. I have a problem here. Hold on. Source Force Source Point Press. I have a huge problem with this. What is that? I'm gonna share the screen because that name is taken. Oh yeah. Dead End Kids was a series of movies in the 30s. Yeah, on Tubi or YouTube or something. I, I still watch them every now and then. Uh, there they are. I would full screen it, but it won't let me for some reason. But yeah, they were <laughs> awesome. This, this is back in the Hollywood days where everybody had to have a unique image. The Marx right. Brothers, the Three Stooges, and the Dead End Kids had funny hats, you know. Right. And they were gangs. They were street kids, you know. Yeah, they were street kids. Uh, no homes. Hence them being dead end kids. Yeah. Yeah. But this comic was cool. <coughs> On a bag of money. It's like throwing uh, one banana amongst 30 monkeys. Didn't, uh, oh, that's right. Ed, Ed Brubaker did that series. What was it called? Dead Enders? Uh huh. Something like the that. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to like that one, but. Bought it for like half a dozen issues and just didn't. Sounds Dorma like a straight bullet. Plot. Dead on. Dead. On. It's like you, you. It's like you read that and you're like, of course, you know. You know like, mm -hmm. <laughs> so far, it's not that good. But I, I enjoyed the first issue. Oh man. I mean, straight bullets is in a class by itself. I don't, you know, I don't expect it to be that good when it comes to crime comics. Stray bullets is whoo. I, I enjoy stray bullets, you know. I mean, it just it just disappeared uh from where I could buy it, you know. So yeah. The first film with Bogart, I think they were first named the Dead End Kids. Yeah, uh, yeah. And they were so yeah. popular they probably went on to their own movies. I saw their stuff, yeah. I saw their stuff on uh PBS when I was a kid. Uh, and then it just sort of would pop up in the oddest places, like on cable at two in the morning. So it's not like I've ever really like dug in and looked at their history. It's just when they were on, I'm like, oh yeah, I would sit down. I, and never even knew that. I, I remember it was like the late seventies. There were a bonus question on one of the, my tests in school. Who were the dead end kids? <laughs> they had I no home. <laughs> <laughs> right in the people that didn't pass this test. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of Bogart, not to get off the track here, but, uh, you know, we all seen the Maltese Falcon, right? right. And uh, it wasn't until I got the DVD, a couple, you know, years ago, whatever. It has this thing on there about the other two, the first two attempts to uh, film it. They had two other movies and they were right. pre-code. And I've never been able to find the pre-code movie. Apparently, yeah. it's. I mean, have you seen it, Scott? I mean, this sounds like something up your alley. No, I've just... Uh... The thing that I was thinking about, which has nothing to do with that, is Adam Savage did some videos about he how he recreated one of the props in the movie of the Maltese Falcon, but it wasn't the only one that was used in the movie. Well, and evidently, yeah. there's a long, convoluted history just about the props of the Falcon they used in that movie. Yeah. yeah. Tell everybody who Adam Savage is, Scott. You, there's people out there that don't know who Adam Savage. Yeah, yeah. Really? That's why he's saying tell people who Adam Savage. Is. Adam Savage was one of the two hosts on MythBusters. And if uh, there we go, if that doesn't tell you who he is, I don't know of a better way to tell right. you. <laughs> yeah, that's that's why I talk funny sometimes. I've gotten into the habit of adding a comma, brief explanation, comma, finish my sentence when I do this. Yeah, gotcha. 
Have a good night, Enigma Vibration. He's heading out. Oh, man. Okay. I was in Scotland. Nice. I always wanted to visit Scotland. If it's not Scottish, it's crap. Named it after me. So. <laughs> I, I once had the, um, the Range Rover media presentation in Inverness. Mm. And uh, we stayed at a, um, at a castle where, where Madonna... I stayed in the same room where Madonna and Guy Ritchie had their honeymoon. <laughs> was it haunted? No. That was another room. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. It wasn't so subtle. Here's my question of the week. Have you guys heard those rumors, predictions, whatever it is, about how DC is going to be doing comics now? You know, bigger issues with backup stories for a bigger price? No, I haven't heard anything about that. I've, I've I've heard about it. Bleeding Cool or something said something. Yeah, yeah. The the, the story goes that you know instead of uh, three ninety nine four dollar comics now because mm-hmm. they want to get them into Walmart or wherever they want a larger price point because Walmart doesn't want to bother with four dollar. It's the old story they used to give on the newsstand too, where the newsstand didn't like carrying twenty five cent comics when they can carry a two dollar magazine, sort of thing. And so now they're talking about, you know, uh, detect Batman or detective comics. You'll, you'll pay $8 for it or something and oh. get 60 <laughs> or 80 pages of comics, whatever it is. No, here's the thing. Uh, for 60 pages, I, uh, it, should be, it should be $4 anyway. Comics in, the United, your, comics in the United States are very expensive for periodicals. They should not, they yeah. should not cost, cost $4 for, for 32 pages. Uh, and even if you want... If they, wanna, shouldn't. Uh, they shouldn't, but the problem is if $4 is too cheap for the Walmarts to bother with. Yeah, yeah, yeah but the, the, that's the, 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 price per, the price per Would page issue. I mean, I mean, it'll keep me well. I'm not buying any $8 Batman. No, comics. I'm not either. I mean, and you can go, uh, what I if it has 200 pages? Uh, but I was thinking to myself, I was, I was thinking to myself, well, who would buy it? Is there an audience out there in Walmart for eight to ten dollar Batman comics? People will buy one here and there, and then this is going to be a speculator's dream when it first hits. These are all number one issues. Blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. The thing about it is, is that it's not a uh, it's not going to be able to sustain itself over time. Nobody is going to be paying eight dollars unless the quality is there a month Mm -hmm. and return back and get that loyalty. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So, especially uh, since the the people who like the the Batman fans, your sort of regular Batman fan, generally does isn't the same type who buys anthology comics. Matter of fact, I've heard from many uh, sort of mainstream fan that they don't like anthology comics because they don't want to buy a pay four dollars for a comic and like one out of the four stories in it. They still have the DC 100 Giants, even with the one new story and the three or four reprints or whatever. <laughs> they still have those at the Walmart going back months. You know, you know yeah. that's what I'm saying. You'll yeah. get a hot issue around then because it's controversial, like that Superman or whatever. Right. Uh, maybe a little Swamp Thing there. People got excited about Swamp Thing. Uh, they're still sitting there. Our Fighting Forces, the Teen Titans, the Flash, they're all sitting up here. I, I have two Walmarts within uh, an hour right. of walk. You know, and uh, they're they're still there, yeah. And they still have yeah, the wrapped right. up three packs from Marvel, and they're not buying them now. I don't see the people paying eight dollars for them now that they're just five. Or oh. are they five? Is that how much they are? I don't know. I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know. I have. Well, I yeah, have I, like, I was just sitting here wondering because because I like I said, we are not the audience for that. It, it, we know we're not going to be buying any eight dollar yeah. Batman. Comic. And besides, uh, looking at the uh, at the interiors, they're completely wrong for the for the format in the in the place where they're sold. Well, you can't just trans uh, tra- uh, transport the uh, the six issue arcs from uh, that you have for people who buy every month to right. a Newston magazine that you don't know if you're going to buy the next issue. To, to me, yeah. each story needs to be one and done. There's no other way about it. 
Mm -hmm. The impulse buy. They're going to have to yeah. place those books near the cash registers so that when some guy is standing there with two screaming kids in the buggy and he just wants to get out of there, he can look over and see Batman escape for a minute and wonder why he's buying mm -hmm. it. It's an impulse mm -hmm. buy. The other thing mm -hmm. is, is that to add to the rumor of this, um, you know, I saw, I did read about Bendis no longer being exclusive and Bleeding right. Cool even turned on him a little bit about being a disappointment and all this stuff. <laughs> they went, they rehashed his Marvel out, whatever. They, they, I couldn't believe that I was reading a Bleeding Cool article that was almost like on the level, just about, you know what I mean? Yeah. But anyway, but the talent, the talent's going to be gone. Uh, DC supposedly, you know, the higher ups have said that there will be no longer be this exclusive high pay for all this talent, if you will, and stuff. So you're not even going to have a name on a lot of this stuff pretty soon to attract fans of that name. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. right, but uh, for impulse buys uh, on a newsstand, the, those names uh, mean absolutely nothing. Yeah, uh, right. The the problem isn't so much that they're not going to pay big names to create stories; it's that they're going to go for the cheapest talent available, and they're going to be complete idiots who don't know how to write. This making is stories what, for complete idiots who don't know how to draw. Yeah, it's that thank you process like not Marvel had in the nineties. It's got Spider Man on it. That's all it needs, you know. Well, oh, well, here's here's what I was thinking. Well, here's what I was wondering too. Let's just say the the quality of the stories are exactly as they are now. Um, once again, I don't care for them. I'm not buying them. But let's just say the quality of the stories is exactly the same, except it's now an eight dollar a month book batman book do you think the comic book fans the, the 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 fans who go to the comic shop every month will do you think they'll they'll remain the same kind of it's like they won't lose any fans if they make it an eight dollar well, batman book they'll have the hardcore collectors that are just you know collecting it out of them no, I'm, I'm talking to let's how many copies a month does batman sell now Eighty thousand. And it's let's, it's going let's... it's going to go down. It's going to go down yeah. because there's one thing you got to think of, and this comes from buying comics and having an allowance right. and not wanting to spend. You know what I mean? But I can get one book for eight dollars. Right. You know what I mean? Or by this time, some I can get maybe two books, or I can get eight dollars, eight books out of a dollar bin, or you know what I mean? There's this or well, or or I'm, or. I'm the same oh. way, but like I said, I'm not I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about whoever that Batman guy is. Who buys Batman every month? Now he's going to get sick of paying eight dollars a month. It just I think so too. And I'm like, will um, and I'm, and I'm just wondering, will like Walmart sales be able to make up for that? No, no, no they got to sell three hundred to half a million copies a month. Plus, when oh, or the or the project I, is a bust. I remember doing the math on the very first Walmart comics. And do you know what the print runs were for those Walmart? The very f when when DC a year or two ago first first started selling those Walmart comics, and they said, "Oh," and I looked up how many Walmart stores were and how many were being. The print runs on those were like twenty five to thirty thousand. No, 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 no. That's a complete failure right off yeah. the bat. Yeah, it will never work. And it I'm gave like, the illusion of these being in demand because you had the same number of comic book fans in that town trying to fight right. for them at first. At first, you weren't getting new fans. You weren't getting people. Exactly. That's exactly what I was, I was like. Those weren't mass numbers. Right. Those weren't numbers that'll move the needle. And I'm thinking, how are they? It I, was 30 monkeys trying to get one banana. Right. I mean, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It, it didn't make any new monkeys. They were there to begin with, you know. And it's like I say, it's got to be half. A, it's got to have projected sales of half a million. Otherwise, yeah. it's just not going to work. Yeah, and in, in the economy as it is today, you know, you know, during the um, COVID era, you know, some people, you know, are out of work, not doesn't have enough, you know, spending money as they used to. But then it's all in besides. Well, also when you think, all right, it's this issue is going to cost what eight dollars seven ninety nine. Right. Million. For five dollars more, you can get a subscription to Netflix for a month. Yeah. Yeah. So if the size, it's the new it's the new stand. Yeah. Not even Time Magazine sells half a million copies a month a week. Nothing sells half a million copies a week. Yeah. So it's not going to be a Batman book that does it. No. 
So, I'm just wondering what, how, where they're go, if they're going this way, and how it could possibly work out. I was just seeing. I mean, I don't know. It, it just, it just it's, scares me to see that they're doing that. If they do that, who needs? It's knows? going to be coloring books. Coloring books cost six or seven dollars now. Yeah, some, of, some of them, you know, at Walmart. Yeah. It's going to be coloring books. It's going to be little golden books. It's not going to be. It's DC Comics Batman. It's, it's going to be a presence there. And it, and, and, and it's, you know, we're in unknown territory with what's going to go on with these, but there's no way an $8 book is going to be sustainable for any long period of time. If it doesn't have the talent and something to bring people back. Yeah. Um, if, if Walmart wants to get a big hit, they need to start getting into these Marvel preview books. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, <laughs> and, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, I, I think, did not anybody, Steve I Marvel. <laughs> You know, I rarely, I rarely say anything about like other channels and all this stuff and everything like that. But I think anybody that's pushed this Marvel's preview book have heard, you know, they deserve to be um, made fun of, you know, and people, uh, you know. all that is, is people need something to collect. <laughs> and it is so, e and, the, and the same thing with all these, you know, alternative covers, they appeal to people who need something to collect. Nice. Well, well, the thing about Stephen Platt, though, is he made enough money f for a lifetime, I think, in those few years he was working. Amazing. He went they to prop. I bet Rob Liefeld. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jared. I said they paid him a lot at Image, I think. Well, well Rob Liefeld gave us a number, didn't he? $40,000, if I recall correctly. It, it was even more than that, I think, with royalties. Like, that was like 40000 or I think he maybe even said eighty. It was a... It was a lot. He could have easily clean like those. A lot of those images. I, I remember hearing the story of um, Larry Stroman doing the tribe. I made, have all three issues. Yeah, made a million dollars on those three issues. Are you serious? Yeah. And that third and one just kind of didn't work. Wow. And that's what happened to. Him. But you have to imagine. You have to remember those 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 early image comics were selling. A million or two issues a piece. The quality so, of those tribe books, if you will, to mm -hmm. find out that he made a million bucks. And that speechless. number may be exaggerated. I'm not I'm even speechless. sure. I'm speechless. But he, they, those guys were making a lot of money then, and which is one of the reasons their books were so late. You're a 22 year old artist. And you just drew a comic book for one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. You want to go spend some of that money, mm -hmm. man? Hey, you don't, you don't feel the need to come up with another comic then the next yeah, month right because away, what you made in one bigger issues with backup stories at a higher price point seems to be the go-to tactic by CDC. They did it in the DC implosion back in the seventies and Dude. the years before DC fifty-two. I remember reading that Marvel was there was some sort of uh, collusion gentleman's agreement back in the 70s with Marvel and DC both raising their prices and going to bigger issues. And then Marvel balked yeah. and managed to gain, gain market share because DC and DC felt screwed. I don't know how true that story. I've read it more than once in like comics history stuff, but sometimes these stories are apocryphal and just wow. get repeated. So I'm not sure. Well, I'll tell you what, a, a majority of my collection was inherited, you know, from that era. Right. There's still things I picked up on my own, but I absolutely loved the 100 page giants, the 80 page giants, the new gods and whatever with the uh, golden age, Jack Kirby backup features. You know what I mean? Um, right. I actually love those, man. I mean, they're yeah. fantastic. Um, and the price wasn't that bad even. I mean, I've never heard my but, uncle or did I ever hear my stepdad ever complain about spending a buck for all that all that book. You know what I mean? But the, the thing and is, back then, you were a kid and you couldn't get those reprints any other way. Yeah. Nowadays, if you're... You know, as a grown up, you're not buying that. You wouldn't buy an eight dollar book that was two thirds reprints. And if you're a kid, you have like you see, kids to if, if you're young and just getting into comics, you have so many back issue, cheap back issue bins available to you. 
so that you might not want to pay eight dollars for a book that's what I'm saying is those 70s, 100-page giants that we have such great memories of wouldn't work today, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, it would work for a kid. You know what I mean? Who picks well, it up. It might not yeah. even work for a kid because yeah. that same store where there's an $8 comic with two-thirds reprints, he can walk over to the dollar bin and get you – know, to a kid like you, like to us, and like let's say 1980. A comic book from, you know, 1940 was forever ago. Now that's a comic book from 1980. Yeah. Right. Well, the other thing you're, you're forgetting, everywhere. The other thing you're forgetting is that kids still go out with their moms. And where's the right. mom more likely to go? The grocery store in Walmart or a comic book shop. Now right. the eight dollar the eight dollars to try to get that book's going to hurt the kid with the age we're yeah. talking about. But you know, that's what I'm trying to say. There's a catch 22 there. You know, they're, they're saying they want younger readers. They got a perfect opportunity. Moms take their kids to the store, but $8. <laughs> no, mom's not going to do that. You know, mm -hmm. you know, don't put your books out on the first week of the month at Walmart. If that's what you're going for. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, but they, they shouldn't <laughs> expect the comics to still be, still be $1. Uh, I'm, Pretty sure that as, apart from the fact that the outsiders view comics as collectible and going up in price, uh, that there's the idea that if you as reading material that they're they're supposed they're supposed to be cheap and that they're still cheap. I, I think I remember so, uh, someone mentioning a, a line from a Johnny Bravo episode uh, where little Susie says that she's thinking about spending fifty cents on a comic, and that was in the mid nineties. When yeah. comics were not fifty cents anymore, they they were one fifty going on two dollars. Well, let's let's also look at what's eight dollars at Walmart. They have five to seven to ten dollars CDs. Seriously, movies starting at three seventy four. Okay, action figures. I, I paid attention to this. Now start at like eight dollars and up to twenty. That blows my mind. You know, what two I mean? packs of Pokemon cards. Pokemon yeah. cards aren't cheap either. There you go. I, I know they had that aisle where you got all your card games. That's where the comic right. books were found. See, uh, I pay eight dollars just not to have to go to Walmart. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. You know what I'm saying? But I'm just saying, if you walk around a store like Walmart, you know, I mean, eight dollars gets a lot more. You know. Right. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so. I mean, I got a juicer for fifteen bucks. You know, to make my fruit <laughs> slushies. I could buy two comic books. Yeah, I could buy. I, I, I could get it. It's right there. But like, <laughs> I, I could buy two comic books, or for a dollar less, get something to make me a fruit smoothie. <laughs> Either way, you're gonna have a lot of pulp when you get done. Yeah. And then for those bachelors out there who probably are the guys that read the comics and stuff, for five bucks you get that rotisserie chicken that lasts you two days. <laughs> I've been there. I'm that guy. I know, you know, I know, yeah. You know, so. Right. <laughs> right. Did I go too far, guys? Sorry, man. I mean, no, I, was in zone. I was in the zone, you know. From the 80s up, they have had a problem where they're, you know, the, the level of bang for buck for what you get compared to other forms of media, it's kind of tough to compete. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, his old 2008. They've got some collections of Judge Dredd coming out that I'm wanting to check out. And and the problem with his comment right there, saying that there's no creator um, currently works for the big companies, is do we even know any of the creators anymore who work for the big companies? They've done we, such a job of purging everyone and looking for newer and cheaper talent. I see, don't even know anyone anymore. We're starting to get a trope with this show, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things we come back to. Who are the people making comics now? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I get that Coates guy's name wrong, which, but, but usually it's not out of like, you know, my funny way of getting names wrong. Right. I really, this guy, everybody's talking Donnie about. Coates. I can't it's Danny or Donnie to me. I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know. This is the where is it? The oh no, the crossovers was the first thing I ever bought by him. And that's an indie one. What does it say there? DC will eventually go down to 15 books. Then when I see, I don't know. DC here's, is just so up in the air. I don't know what they're gonna be doing. Here, here's one of the things I'm kind of curious about. It just popped in my head while we're talking about that dude. And he's got that crossover book. 
Right. Uh, it's been, it, 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 this is probably a non-issue. It's just that I can remember things, but you know, you know what happens whenever you get some star like Will Smith or somebody who decides they want to do a comic book. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Well, uh, there's a book, a book called Berserker that Keanu Reeves is involved right. in and it just demolished the big crossover book to where they have to do a stunt where they're covering up, covering up the fourth issue of who's beside Madman trying to get some steam back because they just got mm-hmm. crushed by Berserker because of yeah. Keanu Reeves. Yeah. What happens if we keep getting stunts like that to get books sold and they never go anywhere? These books don't stick around. They're, they're um, stunts, you know. You know what? I don't think stunts are a bad thing. Well, it, it, like, if it's all the time, I think. You know? I, I don't know. Even if it's all the time, let's just say that once a month, some Hollywood type makes a comic. If that gets an extra 10,000 people into other comics, I think that's a good thing. Uh, but does that happen? Well, I don't think it will. It doesn't. I mean, I, I, all I, experience I we have with celebrities doing comics is that those comics sell even less than than regular comics. I'm 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 all for promotional stunts. I'm okay with that. I'm not sure they're going to work, and I certainly don't think all comics will be replaced by promotional stunts because there's not enough money in it. <laughs> well, J.J. Abrams used nepotism to get his son a Spider-Man comic mm. book that nobody talks about. So that's what I'm trying to say. This does happen. Has that one even ended? I don't know. Nobody's buying I, it. I Everybody remember knows. About like the first and second issue, and then nothing. Yeah, they promote yeah. like J.J. Abrams is involved in a comic, then you find out it's for his son. He's letting his son do it. You know, the millionaire made a deal to where his son gets to write a comic book because he felt like it. People don't respect that. I feel bad for the kid because um, he's got a great opportunity. But, you know, I, even I, I, King's son, you know, changed his name to Joe Hill and made his own way. You know, yeah, and he was I, smart. He was, huh? He was smart for doing that, too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I used to be more cynical about stunts like that. Now I'm just like, all right, you know what? Stunts are a part of life. Then get some attention to com- comics are at such a low point that they need some attention. Yeah, do I mean, you guys anything. remember that? Do you guys remember that drama that happened a few a few years ago uh, when uh, that rapper guy Rampage uh, tried to do a comic and who was some star said they wouldn't buy it? They weren't going to order it. And then all the fan, all the fans were were harassing him on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> no, the Twitter outrage yeah. will be fantastic. Yeah. But that was before the Twitter outrage was still a thing. It was early on, and it was early on. He, he, comic book resources was still respected back then. <laughs> oh wow! CBR. <laughs> uh, but but I, I remember that people that all the fans like, yeah you should order that comic okay but when i when i never i never saw any reaction with the rampages fans saying that they were going to buy the comic and even if they did did they understand that there was a number two right yeah, yeah. so it so it doesn't work even if you have that number one success in the room, it I, doesn't work I, for I, number two I still don't resent them for trying a stunt comics, you know, just because it it beats relaunching with another number one issue and killing Wolverine and putting three Wolverine characters in his place, well, you know. I'll I take a Keanu Reeves comic over Wolverine number one again. What'd you say, yeah. Scott? So those are stunts in and of themselves. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm going to no. put you a quarter way on this one, just a quarter. Like, I'm going to come okay. up not halfway, but a quarter. Because anything is better than uh, putting a uh, bullet hole through the middle of a comic all the way through. Mm-hmm. All right? <laughs> is that a See, I'd rather get, get a comic with a bullet a hole in it than comment. another no- Wolverine number one. Now, Tim, what we do is we get a turkey-shaped bag, and we fill it full of comics, and we drop it from a helicopter. <laughs> As God is my witness, I thought turkeys could fly. The shake and bake edition. You yeah. talk about it. You talk about a stunt. That's that's the way you do it. <laughs> the evil Knievel. Yeah. The, who was the evil Knievel funny dude that used to be like a bizarre Super Dave? The oh, Super, Super Dave. Dave Super Dave Osborne. Super Dave. The He's no longer with us. He's in our hearts, brother. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
Maybe you should get let's, out. Let's see what's coming out in the comic shop news. The Marvels is finally on the schedule again. The art looks nice, the black and white art, but I was never a Marvels fan to begin with. So, you know, the odds of me picking up the new Kurt Busiek Marvel series, but I might only because it sounds it. It's just Kurt Busiek and who's this artist? Um, if if I get it, it'll be the trade, but I doubt I will. Right. There's no Marvels without Ross. Well, it's interesting you bring up Kurt Busiek. You'll dire sinar. Okay. See, <laughs> A lot of times these non-American names too scare me off because I know they went and found cheap foreign talent. Yeah. And I'm just like, it was this guy, the best guy. And his art, there's nothing. I mean, his art looks perfectly fine. Right. But I'm always kind of like, this is the best guy I for the job. Or... For, he, he worked for DC a few years ago. He was doing that uh, Justice Society around the, not New 52. And and he might be as American as me too. I mean, I'm just judging yeah, the, the, him by the, the, me not being able to pronounce his name. Yeah, the name's Turkish. So, okay, but like I said, that scares me off from a lot of Marvel and DC stuff. Um, and it's not that the art is bad either. It's just that the art is kind of just there. You get what you pay for. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, think about all these great artists out there who may be available or who may need the work or may not, whatever. But it, it gets a whole other dynamic in your head right. that you get this crappy work because they don't want to pay for more. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, or whatever. Or yeah. they didn't like the guy's politics or whatever, you know. Right. Whatever they did. They... And, and it's like, like I said, I'm looking at the artwork right here, and it's pretty. Ain't nothing wrong with it. It's not great. It's once again, we're back to this is solid B level art. And that's the best. And just knowing that's the best we're going to get from if Marvel. You, and if you had told me in 1994 that I'd be in 2021 reading reprint comics by Messner Loeb's and Mike Diodato Jr. and enjoying <laughs> them from night that the books are from 1994, <laughs> you're not going to enjoy it in 1994, but you're going to fucking love it in 2021 when you see what you can compare it to. I never would have. Yeah. And part of, yeah, and part of that is the price. Paying one dollar for those true believers reprints. I bought a few of them, which you know I would have never bought in a million years if they were four dollars. Look, yeah. Ivan Rice, I met him at Heroes Con and found out that he was selling right. things online for a hundred bucks, pages he was doing. Uh, Ivan Rice is like a I don't want to say a Neil Adams quality guy, but I mean he's a quality artist. He's good. Yeah. But where he lives out of the country and stuff, you know, selling his, he was, he was actually selling pages for a hundred dollars online comic book, full comic book pages, yeah. Superman busting out of his shirt. That's the one that right. I remember somebody buying for like $110. Um, so the talent is out there and stuff. So I don't know why they're just taking these people like you're set, just lay on the ground. There's talent out there, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe it's who submit. I don't know how they find these people. I think they no, post they their actually, art online. They post they their art online somewhere and find them. Under Ike Promoter, um, what's his name? Uh, C.B. Sabolsky. His job in the early 2000s was a uh, new talent coordinator or something like that. And he actually traveled cons all around the world looking for cheap talent. And there's, that job continued after he left it. They, they, that was actually Marvel's policy under Ike because he wanted to. And that's why so many of the old guys aren't there anymore because they learned the lesson of the Filipino artists in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. If you remember what happened with them is they paid the Filipino artists less. Mm -hmm. And then the Filipino artists found out and there was this big uproar and they had to raise the price for all the Filipino artists. What they did this time was they found this foreign talent and then just lowered all the prices for everyone around 2010 or so. And that's <laughs> when there was a mass exodus of all that old talent because all of a sudden they weren't making, you know, their $300 a page rate was cut to $125, $150 a page, that much. But, you yeah. know, if you're working in Turkey, $150 a page, that's a lot of money, you know. So that's what happened. That's why you see so many foreign names in comics these days. And they're all adequate. I mean, they're, they're all perfectly, like, you know, there's not the, the art is fine. 
It's solid B level art. But like I said before, you know, there's there's no um, creators. There, there, there's no what was that term I used? I can't even remember now. Superstar, uh, creative powerhouses. Uh, oh yeah, of course. There's that. There's you know a, a lot of new color. Well, I think that is. Um, I've been finding that. You know, when I talk about collectors need stuff to collect, that's what I mean when I say that's who these one in 25 covers appeal to. Well, I tell you what, I, I, I'm not sure how people pick and choose, but I've noticed that some of the Adam Hughes covers like from Legionnaires and Legion of Superheroes, uh, maybe She-Hulk. Uh, I've been finding that some of these Adam Hughes covers are worth money. And they're not the special one in you know variant covers right. or anything. Yeah, just I don't know. Maybe they're just obscure because it was a smaller series, you know, or something. But uh, he's right about the covers. I'm, that's all I'm saying. He's right about the covers. He mentioned Adam Hughes, and I just started noticing. I've got some books well, that went up in price, and that's the only reason I can figure it out. Well, well, well here, here's what it, here's what I think it is. Think back to the '80s and even the '90s. If you were a comic book collector, I don't mean a reader like us. I mean a guy who liked, maybe read some of his comics, but liked to collect them, liked to collect the hot stuff, liked to collect this, liked to collect that. It's that sort of collector's mentality, that um, that hunter-gatherer, I've got to go get berries from the woods sort of thing. Um, what did you have to do? You had to go to the comic shop every week see what was out. You had to hunt through back issue bins. Maybe you took a special trip once every two months to some other state with whole other comic shops. Um, uh, this is even before when, when Wizard Magazine came around, they could finally tell you what was hot. But before then, you had to figure it out from yourself. And even when Wizard Magazine told you what was hot, you had to still go out and find it because that was all kind of in the past. Well, oh, this issue is getting hot, you know, um, Amazing Spider-Man 294. And you had to go and look for 294 and get it. Nowadays, what does the collector have to do? He can uh, he can go to a comic shop and put a comic on his pull list and get every single issue of it. He can find any issue he or she wants on eBay, on Mile High Comics, on MyComicShop.com. He can go to Instagram. He can go to facebook i just talked about this in my last video yeah go ahead any, yeah. Comic, any comic you want you can go and get immediately for cheap yeah so what ones can't you get that easy a one in 300 cover a one in 25 cover right. so that's who that appeals to so all of a sudden now they've got something to hunt for now they've got something to look for and i think those the rest of i mean we don't care do you have you ever cared about a one in 25 cover I'll be right back. Hold on. Very rarely. Yeah, exactly. You might see one you like and go, oh, that's a cool cover. I wish I could get it. And then you, right. the next day you didn't remember it existed. I would have, you know, it's interesting you bring this up because just the other day I was looking at the digital version of previews online mm -hmm. and discovered, boy, there's there's not as much stuff coming out these days that I actually want to spend money on like there were a few years ago. But there was one comic in particular, I can't remember which one it was. It had like 25 different cover variants. Oh, that's all of them now. There's so like, many comics. This one was just, just so blatant that I was like, they just put me off from ever wanting the book. I get, um, like I said, every week I get from my comic shop final order cutoff. And then it's variants in there too. And companies like Dynamite, there's 10 variants to this issue. 10. <laughs> At least I would be I impressed if you had a company these days that included all the different covers as like a pinup in the back of the issue, you know, whichever issue they do that include all that. I've, I've mentioned before, I'd buy a comic that, co like, if Marvel once a, once a month put out a comic of their 30 best covers, I might buy that. Right. Is but this got showing there. up? Is that label showing up? I, yeah, I do not see the label. Comic. Okay, I, I can't read the label, but I can see it. It says variant comics, variant oh. covers. Oh, okay. This I have two of these of nothing but variant covers. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants them. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I'm gonna come over there and change the uh, R and that to an L just to confuse you. I, oh, I have. Well, that's what it already confused me because I have a box that says Valiant also. Right. That confused me. 
Okay, so I got all of those for a quarter of, not all of them, but a ton of them for like a quarter a piece because this comic book right. shop couldn't get rid of them. And they are yeah. priced for $10, $10 $25. Right, I got right. the videos up where I bought them and, you know, did the math and all this stuff. I got something like $800 worth of variant covers for 25 bucks. All right. Yeah. Nobody wants them because we move on to other variant covers. I've got well, 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 Wolverine. What it is. Wolverine. It's not we. It's those collectors. It's once they satisfy, they get that variant cover. It's in the box. They're satisfied. And they've moved on to the next variant cover. So That's I don't think they have that much back, back issue appeal. Because all the people, all the collectors who hunted for that variant cover and got it and were satisfied, they're done. So yep. the, it's not like, you know, all of a sudden, it's not like there's a, that he's going, oh, but what about that variant cover from three years ago? He doesn't care about that one. Right. That's, you're saying exactly what I was going to get right, to. I've right. got the proof right here. Right. Um, I got them because they were JSA and they were there and they were sketch covers well, and stuff. And that's also because of the way they sell the variant covers. If it's a one in 25 variant cover, that means you have to buy 25 issues of the other cover. And so you have 25 issues of the regular. And also, if um, let's say they put out three 1 in 25 covers, you buy the 25, and then you're allowed to buy the, the three, so you get the three, no one might care about two of them. So those two of them just sit in with the other ones. Right. It's that one that got hot. Yeah. Yeah, and like I said, the, so that mentality is if you get ahead of the game, if you collect that way, is let go of yeah. that one that everybody's hunting for, get ready for the next one. Right. You know what I mean? They're, like, Yeah, yeah. Cause, and it may be that they printed 3,000 of this variant cover, and there's 2,500 variant correct collectors who wanted it. And that well, 2,500 got satisfied. There's 500 left over that no one wants. I'm the guy that remembers when uh, DC 52 had a Justice League issue that had 52 variant covers, one for every state of the United States. Oh, you and, remember uh, Remember yeah. when Gen 13 came out, number one came out with 13 different covers, and that was the most outrageous thing we'd ever heard? Yeah, and I wish I'd gotten that Vertigo cover. I'm not going to lie. You froze up again, Jared. Yeah. Uh-oh. I'm going to drop out and then come back. And then, you know, Star Wars comes along a few years later and says, hold my beer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's been other things. I think Mars Attacks, don't take my word on it, but I think they had one cover for every card from the 1955 or whatever it was, 50s card series. That I don't remember. That's I, have one, I have one or two of them. I don't know if they did the whole series of cards, but they had a crap ton for that Mars Attacks number one. I like Mars Attacks. I should uh, dig some of those up and read them. I'd like to check out the, for some reason, I want to check out the Savage Dragon versus Mars Attack, but I don't want to buy it. I just want to borrow it. You know, I'm like, you know, I'm like, you know. <laughs> oh, you brought up an interesting about buying versus borrowing. You know, at, at one point in my life, I, it's like I, I had to own certain things. And now it's like, as long as I have access to it, whether I own it or not, I'm okay with it. Does that make any sense? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that just reminded me too. I I, I um, read a comic on Hoopla this week that I really liked, mm -hmm. and that's uh, Steve Epting and Garth Ennis's Sarah. Oh, is that from the one about a Russian sniper? A Russian sniper in the beginning of World War II, and I had read the first issue of it like last year when TKO released it as a promotion digitally, right? And I was lukewarm on it. Mm -hmm. because it, it was kind of the first issue was kind of exactly what you would expect it to me. Uh, you know, World War II, woman doing a man's job, the things she faces, da, da, da. You know, the, the story, we, a story we've read before. Right. But as it got deeper into the series, it got better and better. When we learned more about her personally and her story and, the, you know, the conflicts she faced in her own life because um, here she was. Like I said, this is the beginning part of World War II when Russia was losing badly and um, the Germans were just massacring the Russians and the Soviet government wasn't much better. They were massacring their own people too. So um, it was, it just be the story just kind of got deeper and more personal as it went on. And I really enjoyed it. I, 
As a matter of fact, I went to um, put it on my uh, wish list on Amazon to get a physical copy of it someday. Mm -hmm. Read. And I noticed they had a sale on the digital copy for $2. So I bought a digital copy for $2 right then. Because I'm like, eh, $2. So, so, so check out Sarah by um, Garth Ennis and Steve Epting and I think Elizabeth Brightweiser on Colors. I, saw really it. Good. I had an email or something the other day that had some kind of article about that on it. It looked interesting. <laughs> and from what I've read of the Eastern Front of World War II, just absolutely brutal conditions. Just oh yeah, it was terrible, it terrible. Um, I had to answer a um, a text that my wife sent me an hour ago. Not a big deal, right? But my phone went off after I messed with it, and I've got people watching my Legion of Superhero videos from like three and four years ago commenting on them. <laughs> and look what I found from three years ago. It's not going to show up, but uh, hey, Palo. You had you left a comment on my video anything. three years ago. Yeah, it's not going to show up. Paolo said, I have all five showcase volumes of the Legion. I decided about a decade ago, 13 years now, I was going to, <laughs> I was going to become versed in Legion of Superhero lore. Turns out the first years was a bit simple, silly, typical DC. There's a gimmick with the twist story. When it came, I didn't know it was this long. Uh, when it got to Shooter's first story, you could tell it was completely different. Much more action, different camera angles, snappier dialogue. Kurt Swan followed Shooter's layouts in the first two or three stories. It's a shame Shooter didn't keep on doing them. As Swan went back to his boring old self soon after. So, Paolo, <laughs> after three years, you still feel the same? No. <laughs> about Kurt Swan. Yeah, I, I, I never got excited about Kurt Swan. Neither did I. <laughs> I love how I'm doing a live show and stuff like that, and it's like Woody <laughs> Allen, man. They're going back at the older stuff right now while we're doing it. <laughs> I should be glad anybody you watches call, it all. You know, <laughs> you call those sleeper comments then. <laughs> what? What? Did you say so you talk about Woody Allen? Would you call those sleeper comments? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I think you finally found the term I've been needing. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> And Tommy Bagley says it's easier to make fans of characters than fans of the comic book that feature your character. Yeah. I've said that's how Marvel and DC have trained fans. And I've, and I've, and at times I've tried to break people of this. They've trained because you start reading comics when you're a kid. At least we did. Maybe they don't today. And they teach you to be fans of the character and not the creators. So whenever I hear, whenever somebody asks me who's my favorite character, I'm like, I don't have a favorite character. You know, I gave that up years ago. I follow creators. And when people still say, oh, I have a favorite character, I'm like, they're not your favorite character. They're, you like whatever so-and-so did with that character when you were young. Well, That's what you're a fan of. Otherwise, you'd be buying it today, and you're not. <laughs> we ended up watching some game show, and I want to say it was like Name That Tune, but I could be wrong. I think it mm -hmm. was, though. And I thought of you, Jared, with what you're saying here, too, because they actually said the hostess got up there and said, we're going to turn this up to 11. <laughs> you're there's someone else who doesn't get the joke. Right. And I turned to my wife and was like, she doesn't get the joke. She's part of the joke. And I tried to explain <laughs> it. And I just, I just quit. I just quit. She's like, it goes, I swear, I think she said it goes to 11. You know? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Doesn't get the joke. Moved on to <laughs> young Sheldon. Moved on to young Sheldon. Guys, young I'm gonna have Sheldon. to wrap it up here in a few minutes. So what do we got here? We got another one. Will there be any future iconic comic covers if everything gets a variant cover? Imagine the death of Electra issues or days of future past. No. Even regular what? covers will never be iconic again for the simple reason that none of the, of the covers are designed to entice you to buy a comic right right so there's no the drama they're they're just drawings yeah they're, they're trading cards you know that's <laughs> exactly what i've been saying before right. i was actually about to say that is like there's nothing wrong with collecting like that but you're not reading no. the book nine times out of ten you're you're collecting giant trading cards that's all you're right. doing i've said it for years yeah um I mean, I, I really hate that it gets called comic collecting when you're doing something completely different, you know? Right. Which reminds me, did you guys, you, you guys know Don the Comic Book Junkie, longtime YouTuber, been around for a while? 
I had just posted something on Instagram where he might be selling his whole collection. So he can focus on his movies. Right. I was like, holy <laughs> cow. Yeah. Now, for you guys that don't know, Don Comic Book Junkie, just by looking on his Instagram, he's got a YouTube channel. But uh, he's got a room full of comic boxes, and uh, they're stacked like three high. He's made a mo an island in the he's middle. He's got like 25,000 copies. Yeah. Comics. And and he took pictures where it runs out into the hallway. He's got against the walls of the hallway, them about three or four boxes high going down there. So he's got a room that actually spills out comics. He wants to sell them all in one lot if he can. But we'll see what happens there. <laughs> but but he, he always seemed to me to be one of those obsessive collectors who doesn't read any everything. He, he just bought and he and he and he doesn't buy expensive comics. He likes to buy runs of cheap comics that he finds. Yeah. That's why he yeah. so many of them. Well, what's funny about that happening is that I don't, I've don't. i never scripted a video, but I uh -huh. actually sat down and I had some free time and scripted a little bit of a, for a, you know, something to read over a video. And it actually talks about that. If I had not been lazy and made the damn video, I could have been like, hey, Don, check this out. You know, no. like, <laughs> it's all right. I call him a heretic and a blasphemer. <laughs> it's, it's all right. Yes, man, pages if I just got off my ass and did it. <laughs> but but my me bringing up Don um, makes me think that a lot. I think a, a lot of these like comic co cover collectors don't last long in the hot. They get bored with it eventually. I think. Oh, I guess you're saying yeah. It's uh, it's something yeah. they they just get out of their system at some point. It's yeah. exciting. It's it's like um to me it's kind of like I hate to say it but and, and, and I may be way off the mark but it's like an adrenaline junkie you get the adrenaline yeah. from doing something but when you do it over and over and you meet that goal and it gets easier and you get good at the hobby however you're doing it and it you know what I mean it reaches a point it gets easy at a certain point you know right um and then all of a sudden you're not getting that adrenaline rush and you've got to switch it up. Right. Yeah. Like for us, the adrenaline rush is reading the comic. Uh -huh. Except for Scott, who doesn't read comics anymore. He doesn't get that adrenaline rush. But uh, for, some people, for some people, anymore. yeah, his for next challenge people, is trying to figure out how to open a wine bottle without a corkscrew. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> for, the, for some people, the adrenaline rush is buying the comic. It's not reading the comic. It's yeah, owning I'm gonna, the comic. Yeah, I'm going to use my power bands to open the bottle next time, Tim. <laughs> yeah, Tom Bates is, I'm right. I'm not a Nick Fury fan, but I love me some Storanko Nick Fury. See, like, like something like that is it's real yeah. easy to see that you are because because no one is a Nick Fury fan. You know, it's it's kind of like so that one's kind of easy to see. Yeah, he'll have some, selling all the keys and getting seven cents for the rest. Yeah. That's how it goes. You know, conversely, I will read Hellboy even if Mike Mignola is not drawing it. Yes, but but that's because you know Mike Mignola has something to do with it and keeps the. That's keeps true. The yeah, he, he has his hand in the works. Yeah. Well, how do you right. explain those you... three cartoons? No, I'm playing. <laughs> I'm playing. Which cartoons? Yeah. You talking about the animated? Some... <laughs> Hello. Something like that. You, you you like with Hellboy. You understand that you trust Mike Mignola yes. not to hire bad people and put uh, out a bad. You're absolutely thing. right. Yeah, but as soon as he does, you're out of there. Check out you know? this comment. Check out this comment. <laughs> 280 to 904. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Way, way, to way to go, Way to go, Gretzky. Five, that's five times bigger than my complete run of the whole Gru collection. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. I was proud of my two boxes of uh, action comics, but hey, you know. <laughs> that's a long run. This Gretzky, e even if you somehow manage to get issues number two to 904, you still can't trade the whole lot for a number one. <coughs> <laughs> Here's Palo popping balloons. <laughs> <laughs> Just to strike Gretzky's dream. <laughs> Next, he's going to smack, he's going to smack the, the ice cream bar out of the kid's hand. You know? <laughs> then he comes up sprinkles. <laughs> <laughs> This, I want to change this one to the cold-blooded show. Nick Fury is an easy one to see that you're really a Storanko fan because mm -hmm. have there been other good Nick Fury stuff? There's been some good Kirby Nick Fury, right? 
Yeah, there's been some remember, good. Um, there's been some the good. Fire. Yeah, there's been some good Fury stuff out there, but uh, it yeah. didn't have a name I, to it. You know, yeah, story. Uh, it was like a one page. I think it's a one page comic that Francisco Francovilla did uh. within the past five years or so. It was just a little one shot story. And there was no dialogue. It was a silent story. But it's like, if he would put out an entire book like that, I would buy it. Yeah. Well, I mean, th there's been some good stuff from Fury, but it didn't have a name on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It didn't have right. the Steranko name on it. Thus, this kind of yeah. bookends what we were talking about with the Walmart books. You know, there's no mm -hmm. name on it. You know, I don't even remember who did the 90s series. Yeah, neither do I. I want to say the 80s series that I'm thinking of, I think it was Keith Pollard. Is that right? Doing some of the art? Because I got yeah, some I stuff. Don't remember it all. No, I got some of the book. A very unique signature style. Yeah. But uh, at Ollie's, they've got some of the 80s Nick Fury stuff collected for, uh, I don't know, five, $5, $8. I can go get it and find out, you know, tomorrow. But, but like, <laughs> even if you think you're a Spider-Man fan, there's a thousand issues of Spider-Man you don't like. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you could be a Ditko Spider-Man fan or a Meta Spider-Man fan, uh, you know, Todd McFarlane Spider-Man fan, uh, Dan Slott Spider-Man fan, any one of those. But yeah. to say you're a Spider-Man fan, I can I can hand you a hundred comics. You'll be like, I don't want those. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not Tommy, really. Nobody, nobody liked the fourth season of The A-Team. <laughs> I can't argue with some that. With you're not here. wrong by like the comics. You're not wrong at all. You know. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you something. The white Nick Fury, the way he lost his eye, is ten times more manly than how old Sam did. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Okay. Keith Holler and Butch need a chunk of the '80s and '90s. Right. Nick. Man, Butch Geis, man. Oh. Right. Butch, Butch Geis's um, cross gen work, where he did oh, what was the name of it? It flew right out of my head. Ruse, uh, Ruse. Ruse is Ruse. a masterwork. Yeah, that is really his best work. Yeah, he just did such a good job with it. Yeah, I just sold those like four months ago. I might have to get them back. I remember the old Micronaut stuff he did? Yeah, someone, someone actually bought them. Yeah, <laughs> I bought them back in the day. Yeah. yeah. No, that's yeah. why I let him go. You know, twenty bucks uh, for yeah. Uh, yeah, because I love Ruse. I have all the issues on my shelf. I really, really enjoy it. I have to reread that one again. I last read it. I don't know, ten years ago. I, I think I read something just a couple of years ago, and then a decade goes by. That's why I've started writing down when I read something, so I can look it up. I might have to do that. I'm because... wondering. Yeah, I, I pulled out a bunch of stuff, uh, you know, just kind of like play around shooting video just to get some fill-in mm -hmm. issues. And it amazed me how many bookmarks I found in things. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, one day you can, maybe you can start collecting bookmarks. And when you get tired of it, you can sell them. Well, I'm sitting here like this little drawer. There, you, you can, can hear it. I can get bookmarks in. And I was wondering why I didn't have any left. I'm like, somebody stole my bookmark. <laughs> there are community people that collect nothing but bookmarks. Yeah, I, I, I remember enjoying that David Hasselhoff as Hasselhoff as Nick Fury TV movie, but I'm not gonna tell you it was great. I don't even remember it now. I, I, thought it was, okay. I, I remember it was somewhere than five minutes of it. I was <laughs> sitting there like having this surreal moment that David Hasselhoff is Nick Fury and they made a TV movie. Just just yeah. putting all that together in my head was enough to kind of like blow my mind. Like, what this is weird. <laughs> I, so I don't weird. know that I could watch it today. I'll tell you what. Doing it. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what you can't watch, and I'll be well, we'll find out. But did you ever see that sci-fi man thing movie? Oh no, I don't I may have tried watching it and then bailed. I don't even know why they called it man thing. I have no yeah. idea how it's <laughs> It was deadable. Let me see if there's right, anything guys. else new coming out here yeah. before we go. Hold on. Yeah, check that out, and then I'll have to bail on you guys. Let's see. We got The Locust, number one, from Scout Comics. I don't know what all that's... I have no idea what some of this is. It only comes out oh, like years. Looks like there's a new Godzilla coming out. Whoops. 
Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. Big. See that, Tim? Another yeah, Godzilla. That, that's the same uh, logo and stuff that uh, they did when Eric Powell was on the book a few years ago. Hey, I man, I like Zilla. I just can't believe that a lizard brain could ever be a monkey brain. No. <laughs> but aren't those, aren't those kids next to Godzilla? Is that some sort of wannabe Hanna Barbera thing? Oh, uh, they yeah, look more manga ish. They're very kind of Japanese kid cartoon looking. You know, is, I want. Is Godzuki going to make an appearance? <laughs> I was going to ask, what about Dum Dum Dugan? I want Dum Dum Dugan to pop back up. You know what I mean? <laughs> Dum Dum Dugan led the way of trying to take down Zilla, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> Dum Dum Dugan in that Godzilla book from Marvel. I couldn't believe they put him in the skin tight uh, suit. Yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> they're, they're really milking this immortal Hulk. Where is it? Do I have the right page here? Because it's all they got, man. It's all they yeah. got. Yeah. Nice cover there. Goofy balloon blown up Hulk. Declan Shavy, I think, is doing all that. That's the, um, well, Shelby, pardon me. I'm sorry. The immortal I'm Hulk flatline number one. So Alex Ross isn't doing the cover to that one, eh? I guess not. Oh, and they're coming out with a... Uh, where'd that go? I got my pages all. Oh, there we go. A reprint, an, an epic collection of the Jack Kirby Black Panther plus other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the logo. I've never from read me. all this Kirby Black Panther. I've only read a few issues of it. Yeah. My favorite issue out of that run, uh, if it's you know the one I'm thinking of, there is uh, Black Panther comes out of the desert. Like he's been in the desert for a long time. He just convinced himself he's just going to die, and all of a sudden he runs up on like a tent city. And as he's walking <laughs> through there, you don't know if he's hallucinating or if he's found aliens. Because even as he's walking around, you're seeing it with him. All these weird-looking people and aliens. Turns out he's walked up on a set of uh, Star Wars while they're shooting the movie. <laughs> you know. Well, wow, Joe Manili. I'm gonna have to get this one. They're coming out with a Black Knight number one facsimile edition. Mm -hmm. Nice. The Frazetta. Wow. No, 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 no. Frazetta did the Shining Knight. Who did the Black Knight? Uh, Joe, Joe Manili. Manili. Yeah, you just said that, of course. <laughs> right. Oh, and they're also coming out with um, graphic fantasy number one and two facsimile editions, which were the Eric Larson Savage Dragon 1982 comics. Uh, he that, finally uh, yeah. got, down and got the permission of everybody else who was in the comic. So, put, yeah, put that stuff in uh, Walmart. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. Graphic fantasy. What? Yeah. Around that time, wasn't Eric Larson doing a bunch of inking for uh, uh, for AC Comics and for the, the Canadian guys? Yeah, was it? I don't remember that at all. But I didn't know. I, 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 some time ago, I, I was uh, taking notes from from the Grand Comics database, and uh, I saw Eric Larson's name a, a bunch of times working with people like Gene Day and uh, Mike Gustavich. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Here's, here's here's my problem. The way Marvel is and has been for a while, I don't know if Tom Bagley's joking or not here. <laughs> <laughs> Hulk is everywhere at Marvel lately. A gamma irradiation ir irradiated Wolverine who says Hulk slash. I saw where they merged a Hulk with Wolverine's claws. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So I don't know if he's joking or not. <laughs> oh, here's here's something interesting. <sighs> Mysterious Traveler, Steve Ditko, and the search for a new liberal identity. Is too many people, the best person for it? it too says many liberal? Years of critics have simplified Steve Ditko's work as a representation of controversial author Ayn Rand's objectionist vision. Yeah. Mysterious Traveler argues that Ditko's philosophy draws on a complicated network of ideas that goes well beyond Rand offering new insight into the creator's influence and inspirations. So this is a reprint of his comics and some essays about them. That would be interesting. So I, I don't know to trust it. I want to see 
what they come with with based with the facts, not make the facts be- come up, you know, and, and match their theory. Yeah, here. that's called you'd have to read it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if I no would going to tell you. That. Yeah, I need to know more about the people. Go ahead, Scott. Go yeah, this ahead. gives me back to that video comic book artist where they're interviewing different artists, and then uh, Steve Ditko was the only one that didn't appear on on camera, but they had him reading about his, you know, his ph- philosophy with the end Rand and mystery and everything. And my eyes glazed over while I was listening to <laughs> it. It was the most boring thing I have ever heard in my entire life. And it's by <laughs> University Press of Mississippi. That's actually a very well respected academic press. They, yep. they yeah. publish a lot. It's of not a comic book publisher. No. No. But I, I have one of one of their uh, books about comics, the the one that the, the French guy wrote uh, about the history of American comics. After the last four oh, years, I have to. Oh, I'm just saying after the last four years, I'd have to like really be hesitant of anything that comes off a college campus right now. No. <laughs> That's Jim, what I've for X- about a Jim Lee's X Men Artist Edition, hmm. including yeah, the complete up. oversized X Men number one for all you Did Jim you Lee art the, uh, Artist Edition podcast. No, I haven't heard it. It's interesting. He, the guy tracks, you know, the different artist editions and similar right. books like that that are published and sales numbers, and it, it's interesting. They they've really slowed down on that format. Well, there's so many of them now. There's, but there, guys like me who wanted to buy them can't buy them all. Right? No, you can't buy them all. But I'm just saying. Yeah. And most they, most they of really my most them. of the people I know who were buying those early artist editions just stopped. Yeah. Because there's not enough money and space for all of them. Yeah. I can always make space. That's not a problem. <laughs> I've I've seen your place, man. You're supposed to have a kitchen to eat in. I'm just saying. I do. <laughs> I, I, I do wish I had more counter space. I will give you that. He could put artist editions on it. I bet he's going to find <laughs> out he has a corkscrew. You know, the state. No, I do not. <laughs> I, know, I know that for a fact. Has everybody, anyone here ever read Canto from IDW? C A N T O? No. I don't even know what it is. I've seen that one pop up here and there, and I have a bunch of different little series. But I but I've never read it. I have no idea what it's about. What an odd font for that title. Canto in the City of Giants by David M. Boer and guest artist Sebastian Pires. Canto reunites with the giant guardians of Dis, Fra, and Ba, as well as other friends and foes to recruit the kingdom of the giants in his quest to defeat the shrouded man. None of that means anything to me, but I know there are some people who swear by it. I've just never read it or seen yeah. it. Really. Well, the fact that there's something a little bit um, has been exploited out there that people can get into, it's always a good thing. But, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, but there seems to be like this, uh, ever since Mouse Guard came out, it seems like there's been like a slow rise of people wanting to draw like a children's book. You know what I yeah. mean? Uh, yeah. I got, that, some that, free, that, I got some free that, comic book day stuff, you know, uh, that I've seen this style. Go ahead. Yeah. That, that's like a legitimate comic book saleable comic book style now, where it wasn't probably before Mouse Guard. Yeah. Yeah. Or what was the other one that was like Mouse Guard? Uh, oh, uh, Ice, oh wait Templar. Ice Templar. Ice Templar. Ice Templar. Yeah. And then there's one where this uh, guy's, this kid's toys were alive and they chased some demon that stole their, their kid and owned them. Um, even Vertigo had something about the boogeyman or something out in the woods. Yeah. I don't, I don't follow these books. I can see the covers in my head, but a lot of this <laughs> stuff, a lot of this stuff got pushed, uh, on free comic book day over the years. You know, that's the only reason I've even, I even know they're out there. Um, I was going to say mouse guard has really, really good coloring. Mouse guard's excellent. Yeah. Um, David Peterson. Is Peterson. That the guy? Yeah. It's David Peterson. He's actually the guy that drew my watermark on my videos. He drew that. In, yeah. I met him and he drew it. I told him about the Howling Mouse, uh, that who I was. And he drew like this real simple thing inside of my hardback book. And then all of a sudden on his uh, Facebook or something, he released this picture of a mouse 
sitting there howling on a table and you see three wolves shadows howling. I'm like, that son of a bitch. You know, I'm like, you know, so. And of course, the next phase of DC Comics. For now. For now. The mm -hmm. infinite frontier. They can't even they can't even last two years on a on a track. So uh yeah, they're they're probably already planning the next next thing. At least they're not all 3D models tracings on this drawing, whoever did it. They sure do like standing close to each other in those group shots, don't they? Yep. Oh. And they like rocks. They're either standing on rocks or being attacked by rocks. <laughs> or, they're, or they're running towards you. It's that yeah. same piece of a desert that they used in all the 60s shows where uh, Kirk fought. You're, talk, you're talking about Vasquez rocks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, DC's got their own. They've been using that since like 2008. You know, been when they were still when well, they were still a dollar ninety five for their books or whatever it was. They should yeah. license that to Atari when they're doing all the asteroids ads. Absolutely <laughs> well played. Yes, that's what I want. I want the Atari Force to come back. You know, <laughs> good luck. Need me a little little dart, little tempest. All right, guys, I got to wind it up here. We are right at the two-hour mark. Everybody's yawning. <laughs> yeah, I'm tired tonight. <laughs> and uh, I'm now eight right. minutes late for what I was going to do, but they'll be okay. They'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> but anybody got any last words? I don't think so. I do. Uh, Read do your price guides until they fall apart. There you go. Do what I'm going to do. Uh, if I get some time this weekend, even if I have to play it in the background, jump to Jared Osborne's channel to uh, uh -huh. to um, watch the uh, Cameron Chaos uh, show over there. Uh, post, show. post show, yeah, whatever. And didn't you make a play? Is your playlist public yeah. that has all the Cameron yeah. Chaos yeah, shows on here? Okay, right. Yeah. And, you just uh, copy what? the playlist and uh, yeah, yeah. Now, I'm talking. I popped in for a minute there. I saw you guys had Jeff. Am I remembering his name yeah, right? Yeah, we had, we had Jeff on. Okay. I just realized uh, I meant to ask before the show if he wanted to pop on here, but hey, you know, we got next week. Know, and I'll have you know here, funny how the mind and names work. Uh, when we Right before the show, Paolo was like, we could have Jeff on. And my mind visualized J-E-F-F. -F. And I went, who? <laughs> Jeff? <laughs> and he's like, Jeff, Jeff Sebesta, who we had on. I like, oh, Jeff. it was like, I, because my mind visualized him saying Jeff is J E F F. I had no idea who he's talking about. I, really I did. wonder how many people had never seen the name Jeffrey spelled that way until they saw it in Game of Thrones. I, it's funny. Most people I know have that name spelled that way. I don't know about the rest of the world, but I know a lot of, matter of fact, one, I know one person who I used to work with at Marvel. Uh -huh. Who spells it? Spelled his name. His parents did. J E O F F. I'm like, what's? I was always like, what the hell's that? <laughs> you took the Jeff with a G, the Jeff with a J, and you mixed them. That's just yeah. crazy. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. See everybody later. Have a good evening. Bye. Good night.